I'm going to share with you, you know, very transparently the story of you know, funding a company, getting funded, being acquired, um, then what you do once you get into the, into the company that has acquired you and what the next steps after that are. Hopefully it can be helpful and you know, then we'll move to Q&A and you can ask anything you want around that issue. Um, as, as, uh, as was said in the introduction, we got acquired um, in uh, November 2015. Um, before that, um, you know, in, in, back in 2011, we funded a social casino company in Barcelona, Spain. And you know, one of the things that you realize when you, when you, find, when you found a company um, in, in any industry, and social casino the same, is you know, if people are already exiting the industry, it's probably a little bit too late. And uh, when we founded Akamon in July 2011, some people were already exiting. Double down, uh, play tick on the first transaction, and others. So basically what we had left um, uh, to do uh, in, in 2011 was to concentrate on specific geographical areas. And at Akamon, what we did is to focus on Southern Europe and Latin America. That was our play then. Um, we got funded, small funding from VCs out of Madrid, Spain, uh, four million. We, it took us four years to develop uh, a meaningful size of revenue, be quite profitable, and um, we got acquired in, um, in, uh, in November 2015. Um, you know, we've been consistently one of the top 20 industry players, uh, depending on Eilers, depending if it's, if it's, if you look at web, Facebook, or mobile, but you know, around that. Um, today we have uh, Mundi Juegos, which is our uh, main uh, brand for Latin America, and Best Casino, which is our main brand for uh, North America. Uh, we have 80 employees uh, divided in, um, in centers in uh, Barcelona, Toronto, and Tel Aviv. I'll explain the Toronto st um, story later. And 90 games in all platforms. And we are today, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the only publicly quoted exclusively social casino company. There's other you know, uh, publicly quoted companies that are social casino and uh, real gaming, but we are the only one. How did we get there? So basically, um, I don't know if you guys remember, both in RMG and in Social Casino, the era where Canadian companies were buying companies uh, left and right. And I think at that time, um, uh, a lot of people thought uh, that you could basically take a publicly quoted company, put a bunch of that into it, and buy assets in gaming. You know, that was the story of uh, Amaya with PokerStars, which you know, has evolved after that. What that, was that was a story with Entertain buying several companies, including GameSees. And um, our transaction was basically the same result of that principle. You know, you, could, you take a vehicle in a publicly quoted company and you bought assets. The, the first asset that was bought was DWIP prior to my arrival into the company. And then the second asset that was bought was um, was uh, uh, Akamon. You know, sometimes the stories are look very good on paper and on financial analysts, and sometimes, and then you have to execute on all of those synergies. And uh, does it make sense to put all these companies together? You know, at the end of the day, what did Akamon bring into the picture? Akamon brought casino and traditional games. Uh, it brought a, an exposure to Southern Europe and Latin America, an exposure to a web platform that was working very well and still is. Uh, an open and transparent culture, just a word around that. I'm, I'm a big fan of transparency in the companies that I run. Uh, for example, compensation is transparent. Um, you want to look what everybody makes. It's, uh, it's in a Google Drive. Uh, um, and you know, all employees can know whatever everybody else makes, including myself. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that I think fosters a transparent company uh, uh, culture. Um, you know, and we were very commercial oriented, very transaction oriented in terms of looking at ARPU and our and average revenue per DAU, perhaps less of a product oriented company. DWIP, which was there before us, uh, was a different company. You know, it, was, it had slot games, it was mostly on Facebook, it was facing U US and Canada. Um, uh, it had a little bit more, more of, the, of, a, of a defined hierarchy, especially the founders were very important at that point, and it was more technology oriented because the founders were more from the product and technology side. So you know we got combined huh? because the uh, you know the people that acquired both of us they thought that we could extract some synergies. Well, one of the first things that we found out is that um, one acquisition happened before the other with a difference of around six months, and we were asked at Akamon to now please step in and run both companies um, because these things happen. You know sometimes one of the acquisitions happens before there's earnouts that are ending, some of the teams leave, and then you might you, you see yourself. Um, that, thinking that you sold a company to somebody and now you're asked to run both of the assets. That's exactly what happened to us. Um, so what did we do, uh, what did we do well? One of the things that was a very obvious play 
was to, we, we didn't have any overlapping user bases, you know, because Akamon was concentrated on Southern Europe and Latin America, and DWIP was concentrated on the US on, uh, and, and, and North America. So one of the very obvious synergies was to take content from one company and to put it on, the, uh, uh, on everybody's, on the other company's platforms and the other way around, and also, um, you know, try to cross-sell from one of each other. This is textbook synergy. Hmm? Textbook synergy, very easy to put on a slide, very difficult to execute. But, you know, the, but, the, uh, but the, 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 to make a long story short, it did happen. Um, I think one of the lessons that we learned is that it is much easier to have synergies at the content level than at cross-selling users. Hmm? When you actually put content that you didn't have before on a platform where users are already used to go, uh, that happens, that, you know, that materializes um, when you try to basically take a database of users and telling them to go somewhere else, that's a much more difficult feat to accomplish. Uh, so that was one of the, uh, of the lessons learned. Other things that we do well are less glamorous, but they're important to extract um, uh, efficiencies. Team efficiencies, you know, suddenly you realize you might not need two of that or one of that or one of that. Um, you know, and other things that are more boring, but remember, this is a public company, such as auditors, advisors, suppliers, and all of that. Um, you know, we did gain some efficiencies there, um, and you could expect that uh, if you get combined or rolled in into a larger company, that those things can happen. Let me tell you now the least, less pretty side of the story, because I think that's also interesting. What didn't happen? Um, so what didn't happen is that um, innovation did not explode, you know? Most of the teams on the product and, and the technology side are very used to work with people that are around them. And if you think that by combining assets or being enrolled into an asset, that innovation is going to explode and suddenly new and better ideas and cross-team collaboration is going to explode, I think you're ready for, a, for a, not such a, of a pleasant surprise. In fact, it slows down. It slows down. So that, that at least has been our experience. And to be honest, I've, speak, I've spoken to a lot of people, and that's generally what happens. Distance is a factor, you know? It looks very, again, looks very good on a slide to have a corporate center in Toronto that manages finances and all of that, and then Barcelona and Tel Aviv, great cities, very glamorous. Um, everybody wants to live there. But, you know, the cross collaboration and time distances between those two cities didn't make things, or has not made things as different. Um, and then it's cultural differences, you know? And the, I think at the end of the day, people from Barcelona and people from Tel Aviv are quite similar. Uh, you know, lifestyle is quite similar. Uh, you know, we both live uh, facing the Mediterranean, the other side. Um, but there are cultural differences. There are things as simple as vacation calendar. Um, you know, when one of the areas is on vacation, the other one is not, and the other way around. Um, and all of those things present further difficulties that, you know, perhaps you have not identified at the beginning. What is the outcome? You know, after two, two and a half years, what is the outcome? Well, the outcome is that we, we do have today one of the most geographically diversified companies in social casino, if not the most. This is by chance or by design? Well, you know, it's a little bit of both. You know, but at the end of the day, you had combined already to begin with an asset that was US facing, uh, North America and, um, and uh, US basically, with an asset that was based on continental Europe and North Latin America. If we combine the two, you get a very geographically diversified company. Is that something good in itself? Well, I believe so, because again, at the end of the day, we are seeing um, acquisition costs very high, but mostly in North America, and you are seeing, you know, the fact that you are diversified allows you to, uh, you know, write downturns better. Um, and, you know, when something is not working that well in the U.S., maybe that, you know, you have a better market in Brazil or Spain or France, which, is, which has been our, our case. Another of the outcomes is that um, we've maintained since the acquisition, and this is public information that you can check, very high EBITDA margins. So we, we, we've stayed very, very profitable. Growth has not been ultra impressive, but uh, profitability has. Um, and I think that's a factor of the synergies that I mentioned before. It's a factor also that you know, by being a public company, you are scrutinized, so you continue to be uh, uh, very profitable. However, profitability at the P&L level does not imply that your stock price is going to go through the roof or that your balance sheet is going to do good. You know, one of the things that um, is not secret because it's public information, it did not happen to us only and others, is that both acquisitions at DWIP and Akamon were funded by debt. And you have to return that debt and, uh, and that debt has an effect also on the uh, profitability of the, of the equity holders. But, you know, from a pure P&L perspective, the EBITDA margins have been there. We're now in a position that is different. 
because now uh, one of the challenges in social casino is to grow to begin with. You know, if you look at the um, at the uh, rankings, you basically have uh, three stories. One of them is very large companies that are there, hmm? top one, two, three, four in the rankings, and they will, they are there. They have the benefits of scale. They have the benefits of um, of a lot of data, uh, they can acquire customers profitable, and they're going to stay there. Then you have suddenly some newcomers that enter the rankings. We all know who they are. And uh, they are pleasant surprises to the rankings. And then you also have other people that go down. Maybe their platform is too old. Maybe their database is being old. Uh, they maybe are not innovating. We have been a little bit of the exception. We've been quite stable. But now, um, you know, having access to capital through public markets and also to, to, through financial sponsors, we see ourselves in another position, which is the position of how to become a good acquirer. Um, it's funny. Hmm? You fund a company as an entrepreneur, you get acquired, and now they ask you to acquire other companies, which is fine. You know, it's, I'm not the only one in the industry, uh, but it's, you need to reverse your roles a little bit. And here, I think the, um, the, the, the playbook is a little bit different. And you know, we need to utilize, you need to use everything we've learned in our experience of being acquired to try to be a better acquirer. And I'm going to share those tips with you too. So at the end of the day, we are seeing pretty big acquisitions recently. I mean, they seem a few months ago, but in the scope of time, it's pretty recent in social casino. You know, uh, a China consortium bought Playtica for 4.4 billion. Aristocat bought Plarium for 500. That's an interesting one because it goes out of social casino and it buys a different genre. Um, Aristocrat again, um, you know, Big Fish, which made an interesting play because it goes, uh, uh, you know, land, established land-based casino companies or land-based gaming companies. Churchill buys Big Fish and then resells it for a. a for, uh, for not such a big multiple um, of compared to what they acquired the company. So what did we learn in terms of multiples? Well, simple things. Um, if you are growing and you're very large, you are going to be between, between 10 and 12 times EBITDA. I don't think you're going to see, I still see entrepreneurs, believe it or not, that come to me with very good propositions they want to sell to me at a multiple of revenue. I think that's gone, honestly, I think that's gone. Some people might be the exception if the revenue is very, very big, but I think that's gone. I think what you're seeing today is multiples of EBITDA in the 10 and 12 range for high growth mobile or new platforms uh, um, and you know, lower multiples for companies that are growing less. How low for companies that are growing less? Anywhere between four and eight times. There seems to be a gap between eight and 10 times, which is you know, for, for those that have stopped growing, and then when you grow again, you're 10 to 12. But you know, four to four to eight for you know, less growing and less mobile, or less interesting uh, for what variety of reason companies. What do you do when you buy a company? Well, you actually need to have a plan. I mean, you know, going to conferences and meeting entrepreneurs is just a part of it. Um, I think at the end of the day, you need to understand a criteria that fits your uh, your criteria as an acquirer. Um, you need to, to obviously uh, um, search what your targets are and try to get there and develop a personal relationship. Uh, very important, especially in this industry where you are going to deal basically with people. You're not buying hard assets. You're not buying plants. You're not buying equipment. You're buying people. Uh, and that, I think, is essential to understand. Um, you are going to... Um, Enter a negotiation. Sometimes the negotiation is with the entrepreneur. I prefer that. Sometimes there's a banker. That's fine too. Um, you know, the go-to bankers in this industry, I don't think I'm revealing any secret, are not that many. They are divided by size. Um, you know, smaller and medium. There's basically one or two players. Higher, there's a few more. Um, but you know, we all know who they are. Um, then you know, the due diligence is a key factor. Believe it or not, after Almost eight years of the industry history, um, or even more, there's a lot of people that still fail at the due diligence. And since you know, we're going to go into Q&A later, what is the only thing that matters when you look in a due diligence into a social casino company? Who wants to offer a response? The only thing, or the, the main thing. What single piece of data would you look at? I would look at cohort analysis. Uh, cohort analysis. That's the only thing that counts. Uh, cohort analysis tells you everything that the PL doesn't. And you would be surprised of how many acquirers are still looking at the PL first. The PL 
is an accounting information that is relevant, but much less than cohort analysis. Cohort analysis tells you the health of your paying user pay player base. Um, you know, then you do the purchase, the contracts, and all of that. Then you know, to finance the acquisition. You know, <laughs> there's been a lot of buyers around the world buying, trying to buy companies with no money, uh, and that's interesting, but it doesn't work. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, before we got acquired, you know, there was we we, we saw some buyers with no money. Um, that's not our case today, thank God. But you know, it's uh, uh, as an acquirer. But when you are the entrepreneur, you need to make sure that the person that is making you invest time, others would say waste time, has the money to buy you, and then you know closing the integration and start with the acquisition. So let me take you out of the more formal step process and more into a tip page. Plan, you know, plan. Don't go out to try to just buy companies because it's the flavor of the month. Understand the corporate culture. Um, you are gonna have to live with the, uh, the company that you acquire. You're gonna have to live with these people. Yes, of course, there are incentives. Yes, of course, there are earnouts. Yes, of course, there are uh, legal contracts. But at the end of the day, the personal relationship is what's going to be key. You need to select leaders uh, uh, that you're going to be maintaining the relationship with at the team, at the technical level, at the gaming level, at everything. Um, you know, I'm gonna st uh, skip four and five because they're very obvious. Communicate, you know, throughout the process and when you're integrating, um, and you manage the migration over time. It doesn't happen over the mag magical six months that uh, consultants tells you. We look for rapid growth. You know, at the end of the day, uh, rapid growth is the commodity, is the is the is uh, the treasure today. You know, if you see a lot of the social casino companies, we are uh, um, you know we're struggling for growth except for a few. And I think you know looking for rapid growth is one of the things that you want to do. You look for dominance, and the dominance can be in several aspects. I mean, if you have more than one, that's perfect. It can be a platform dominance. You know, these guys you know, dominate uh, Android, or they dominate iOS, or they dominate something else. It can be a vertical, it can be slots, it can be poker, it can be bingo, or a flavor of that. Or it can be a geographical area. These guys are the kings of Brazil, or the kings of India, or the kings of Indonesia, or the kings of Canada. So it can be any of those dominance, but it's good to buy the leader in one of these uh, dimensions. I think new platforms are overlooked, and they will be the protagonist. They will be the main player of the next wave of acquisition. This is my perception. And what are you gonna, you're going to tell, what's, what is a new platform? Well, instant games, for example. I think instant games with social casino themes, as soon as monetization happens, are going to be the main player of the next wave of acquisitions. That's one of my perceptions. And then we want new genres close, or the word that I use is adjacent to a social casino, that are going to expand the definition of the industry. I think one of the things that we've seen as a limitation of the industry in recent years is the way we measure the industry. I think consultants and people that have made reports on the size of the industry have done an excellent job. Um, you know, if you compare the, uh, how, how young the industry is and how well it measures itself, and you know, how precise the reports are, I think we're doing a good job. However, I think the limitation on how we measure the industry is very big. Let me give you an example. How many Asian social casino companies do you know that serve non-US customers? Because there is a lot of social casino companies in Asia, but the, they're only accounted in the rankings if their customers are in the US. Asia to Asia is not accounted for. Um, and I think that's a big limitation. And I think that's one of the things that you know, will happen, that you're going to discover this set of companies. And other things that are happening is that you will see genres of games that will be considered social casinos suddenly because the mechanics are the same, and there might not be exact slots or bingo or poker, but they're, they're close enough that you can consider those. Um, I'm going to start concluding. Uh, um, basically, it's the same idea. Um, you can be an entrepreneur, you can fund a company, you can uh, be acquired, you can, then you can find yourself in the position of now having to manage more than the asset that you were managing before, and, um, and now having to uh, you know, build rolled in into an asset, and you might also find your position of after being acquired, now you're the person or the team with the responsibility of acquiring. So I think for um, us managing social casino companies, in addition to all the other skills that we had to know as you know, marketing, acquisition, retention, product technology, I think M&A is another thing that uh, we need to be versed on and experienced on. At least this has been my story, and it has been a great pleasure to share it with you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, uh, that was an interesting talk because I had a 
a similar experience kind of I mean I'm not even close to being CEO of anything but uh, I used to work with uh, maybe maybe in your house maybe in the future yeah <laughs> um, but I used to work with IGT and you know IGT bought everything they could buy um, and we came from like a relatively small studio and then it just you know once you get into this really corporate structure I think one of the challenges we saw is like how do you keep this still kind of startup ambience which kind of works for us but still integrate into the big corporate picture so that that was one of the challenges that I found and right. what, thought, what were your thoughts on that well first I mean I, the company that acquired us it was not a big corporate company anyway uh, because they were you know a few financiers in Toronto with a corporate structure so they, they did not have a culture to try to convert us to I think that's an advantage in other industries, I've been, I've been in other acquisitions, and that's a different story. But I mean, I think when people tell me, how do you keep the entrepreneurial company, the, the, the entrepreneurial culture after you're being acquired? My answer is quite simple, is you don't. Uh, you, don't you know, it's a new era. Uh, you don't. And the targets and the goals of your new owners are different than the ones that you had as an entrepreneur. You basically have to look for a different set of motivations and a different set of um, incentives and, uh, and way to attract talent than you had before. I have one. So you talked about some of the challenges you faced in terms of integration, right? Getting the the team collaboration going, uh, some of the impedances to generating innovation out of that. Right. In retrospect, is there anything about that process or that approach that you would have done differently, or do you think that the issues that you faced were just inevitable nature of the beast? It's a little bit of both, actually. I think um, uh, what I would have done differently is that I would have carved out innovation teams that had no responsibility on day to day. And possibly, if I could, for both sides of the company, you know, because we were a combination of two assets at the end of the day, and foster collaboration that way. I think when you, when you have very, you know, targets that are determined by earnouts, and also you become to a public company, so targets are much more obvious and and and, and present. And at the same time, you're asking your team to innovate and take risk. It just really doesn't work. So I think the only way to do that is to basically carve out a team. And you know that you select them based on their merit or abilities, and tell them, yeah, you don't need to worry about the day to day. You're just going to have to create something new. Uh, and I think that's a risk worth taking that I didn't do. You know, yes, I understand that's what the market is. Yeah. That's what the market is. So that's what you have to pay if you want to make an acquisition. Do you th do you feel sort of financially that they are justifiable? That is. You know, if, if you look at the you know IRR of uh, yeah. 10, th 10 to 12 year, uh, multiple, that's still pretty high. I think it's a great question, and I don't get this question asked many times. Um, I think one of the things that the M&A industry in general fails tremendously at is do post-mortem. You know? Post-mortem is not done enough, and the reason post-mortem is not done enough is because nobody wants to look at it. Uh, um, you know, because if you are a CEO and you need to grow, and you know, if things are not happening internally, you're going to have to buy. <laughs> and if you're going to have to buy, you might as well buy you know, whatever, the best thing that you can do and obviously pay the least price that you can do, but you're going to have to buy anyway. And you know, chances are that if you're paying 12 times, which basically means at the current rate of profit, it's going to take me 12 times to make you know, my money back, chances are that you'll never be there 12, 12 years after that. So post-mortem is not some, a science that is being looked at. Now, if we focus on social casino, some of the acquisitions have been very creative. You know? I think Caesars has done a tremendous job uh, about their acquisitions. You know, congrats to them. Um, it's been, I think there's other examples of, of, of very creative acquisitions. A lot of the medium-sized acquisitions, I think they will never be paid back. Um, and the only way to get out of that is either to innovate from the platform of the companies that you've acquired or continue acquiring and, you know, and, and try your best luck. Another thing that fosters these multiples is the low cost of capital. You know, we are in a world of low interest rates. We've been there for a while already, maybe a decade or so. And, you know, there's no sign of this drastically changing. Um, obviously, this M&A frenzy would stop immediately at a high cost of capital. Thank you very, very, thank you.